with the current situation of the country and the changing circumstances after that what steps should the present government take so the economic condition of the country can improve in the near future to know how the country can move forward on the path of progress we have asked former finance minister p chitambaram hello from the conversation with you you are watching dishan javed with you in the news network today the current economic situation of the country is very bad due to corona virus what should the present government do to improve the economic condition of the country to know about tenik jagran of bhopal director and local resident editor of riva tenik jagran sanjeev mohan gupta and his son anshuman gupta has a special conversation with p chitambaram former finance minister of the country economic affair expert let us tell you what p chitambaram member of parliament said on the economic situation of the country so uh, there is my son yeah hi good evening my name is anshuman sir and it's okay. uh, a real privilege to be a part of this conversation and to discuss with you uh, the crisis that we are facing in today's time uh so i had certain questions yes so uh it is suspected that there shall be an increase in inflation due to suboptimal demand uh because which will lead to you know high production costs sir as the people they don't have sufficient liquidity so it will ultimately lead to an inflation in the cost of the products that uh an fm in the fmcg sector sir so so how do you think the current government sir should come up with relief packages for the businesses and also for the people to make sure that there is price stability in the economy and in the country sir so i'm not very worried about the inflation see there are various theories about uh, demand the suboptimal demand etc right sir. the most basic principle is unless there is adequate demand nobody is going to produce the goods and services right it's, it's the depression of demand uh, that is affecting the economy so we have to stimulate demand right. which is why economists have advised that you put cash put money in the hands of the consuming public the masses because right. it's not you and i buying a, a tube of toothpaste a month it's millions of people buying toothpaste a month yes sir so i think um, when demand picks up production will follow and when demand picks up and production follows incomes and wages will rise and if cash is put into the hands of the people and that will take care of the uh, pricing i don't think the, the inflation is the immediate problem the immediate right. problem is stimulating demand right sir thank you sir uh, moving on sir sir uh, in uh, in terms of the salaried individuals sir the salary tax payers of the economy uh, sir there are a lot of layoffs that are happening and a lot of pay cuts that are also taking place and uh, so the one sector the one credit facility sector that all of the salaried individuals undertake is instruments like credit cards personal loans etc so there has been no relief that has been proposed by the government for people who are going to incur interest liabilities on these in instruments at a going rate people are incurring these in uh, interest liabilities sir and are unable to make payments of the same sir how uh, in this time of need when people are facing so many problems and even meeting the basic demands uh, of living is difficult can the government intervene and provide some kind of relief which can in turn uh, be passed on to the individual tax payers sir the salaried people of our country of course i had proposed in a joint column authored by me and pravin chakravarti in the hindu about uh, 10 days ago right that you must have something like a payment a wages protection scheme for the low salaried income tax payer according to the income tax department's database there are one crore people who pay taxes but who report very low salaries they have got some other income now it's a low salaried guy who is facing the um, immediate acts of layoff and retrenchment it's right. a low salaried guy 
who does not have enough savings to take care of the EMI payment and say over the next six months or so. So I think there should have been a payment, a wages protection scheme, the one kind introduced in the United States. We should have a wages protection scheme for the low salary taxpayer. Uh, it's all about one crore of people, but that would help one crore families. But uh, there's no response from the government. There are ideas on the table, but they should take up some idea and examine it seriously. Sir, how long do you think, even if such a proposition is considered, you know, because what the relief that the country needs is now, is immediate. Do you really think that it is possible that if even if the government so wills it, such reforms can be made and can be executed in this time, uh, you know, in a faster pace so that that relief can actually be, uh, which is being sought, can be uh, obtained by the people and they can feel that relief? These are executive decisions. If you have the will, you can take it today and implement it tomorrow. Right, sir. So you, you think it is possible? It is really possible. What is the difficulty? Uh, these are executive decisions. They don't require legislation. They require money. They right. require a willingness to set apart money to meet these requirements. It can be done immediately. And sir, do you think the compliances and the other issues which a government undertakes, which is they have to go through a lot of, uh, you know, there are, there's a lot of procedure involved before implementing such a big decision. And that takes away most of the time and most of the major decisions are therefore halted for years and the country suffers because of that. Not necessary, not necessary. Suppose you announce a wages protection scheme for low salaries. All you've got to do is go by the database, which is already with income tax department. You've got one right. crore names, you've got their Aadhaar number, you've got their PAN number, and simply tell them, listen, if uh, you are facing layoff or retrenchment, uh, please tell your employer to apply to us and we will pay the wages and you will continue in jobs. Uh, these are doable within a matter of days. See, right. when we did the agricultural loan waiver in 2008, they said it can't be done. But we showed it can be done and we did it by June 30 of that year and we wrote off 58,000 crore rupees or so. It can be done. I kept the form for the agricultural loan waiver so simple. All that he had to do is Look at his agricultural loan to history, register in the bank, and if the name is there and the extent of the land is given there, he simply has to make a corresponding entry on the credit side saying this loan has been paid off, added to the number which he will claim from the government. These things can be done. It requires only a little uh, patience and a little uh, homework. It can be done with simple forms. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, sir, uh, the fiscal stimulus package, sir, that you mentioned, it's not for 20 lakh crore and it's only for 1,86,650 crore. The, yes. yes, sir. Yes. So, sir, do you think now that you know, you've brought to light this information to people, how do you think that even if it is 1,86,650 crores, the deployment of this amount can take place in a structured manner which actually brings relief rather than just passing comments and you know queries upon from one person to another between the government and to the opposition you see this 186000 crore falls under i think about 11 heads which i have listed in my table now these are all known heads so even the 186650 crore can be spent in a short period of time if they have the will to do it. Uh, but I'm not very sure whether they have the will to do it. Um, this is always a problem with the government which does not have its heart in the uh, program. Uh, if you have the will to do it, this 186650 can be distributed. Uh, right. These are for identified sectors and it only requires a push. Sir, uh, moving on, sir. Sir, uh, it, uh, you must be aware that the current government has allowed refunctioning of infrastructure projects 
such as civil construction roads infrastructure development projects sir now sir a major thing to note over here is that two of the major uh, industrial materials the raw materials that require for uh, you know this work is cement and steel sir now sir both of these yes. uh, uh, materials sir are under the slab of 18 and 28% of the gst regime that has been brought into the country sir which is making these materials very expensive number one number two sir because there is a, a very little or almost zero retail demand the consumer end user demand for these products at this point of time the prices of these materials have also skyrocketed sir so at this point of time people the companies who are engaged in such activities their working capital requirement or the general capital requirement for refunctioning of such projects has really skyrocketed so sir now that the government is proposing functioning of this sector how should it provide aid to these companies and to this sector so that smooth functioning can be attained these sectors won't start functioning as quickly as the government thinks they will construction for example how can it start functioning when there are lakhs and lakhs of units which are unsold and they have absolutely run out of working capital and there is no buyer you saw today uh, 15 days ago there was a statement and today there is a statement mr munjal of the hero group says i am cutting back on capital investment because i want to conserve cash 15 days ago mr chandrashekar chairman of tata group said he told all his executives in a communication which was published in the media cut back on capital investment because we have to conserve cash you saw reports of people vacating office space you saw vivo stop its construction work therefore today construction is in the doldrums nobody is going to construct office space nobody is going to construct new housing unless there is a demand and there is a buyer already the inventory is so large so unless government steps in with a helping hand we will find many more construction companies will fold up many more many folded up in the last 2 3 years they went to supreme court and you saw half a dozen construction companies have folded up many more will fold up unless the government proactively helps that sector similarly i have said every sector requires sector specific solutions construction automobile aviation i was speaking to an automobile manufacturer he says i can't start production there is no demand i have sold 100 units after the second relaxation now maruti they say sold 5000 units I asked him about it he says those 5000 units are from inventory not from the new production therefore how do i start my factory and start producing cars on the assembly line unless there is pick up of demand See, Thanks. Maruti's five thousand cars have been booked by three thousand seven hundred and fifty dealers. What does it mean? Uh, one and a half cars on average. Right. Yes, That's true, sir. That's true, sir. So there is a policy change uh, when this BJP had come. They marked NPA in ninety days. The government payment we normally get in hundred twenty two days to hundred eighty days. and bank takes collateral they declare you an npa in 90 days how we will survive also sir it is important to note that now the credit facility extended even on uh, in terms of a collateral is just 60% then previously to 80 85% thereby you have less uh, money in against the collateral and even a shorter period of time to make sure that your payments are in line so how to deal with this sir how should the country come together and deal with this this government has taken away all discretion of the bankers this is not the first time we've had an npa crisis right. we had an npa crisis in 2002 3 when mr yashwant sir now was finance minister we had an npa crisis when i was finance minister and i think 2007 or so the idea is to hold the hand of the borrower and the lender and tell the lender mr banker you gave the loan you recover it that message he will recover instead of see some banker will 
roll over a loan. Some banker will extend an additional credit facility. Some banker will convert the loan to equity and take a greater share in the management. Some banker will threaten him with winding up under the company's act. Various methods would be tried and they recovered it. We got out of the NPA program. Now what you did here is one size fits all. 90 days, immediately go to IBC. I mean, which banker will recover? And having completely tied the hands of the banker uh, with the centralized directives, no banker has any incentive to recover. No banker wants to risk anything. He simply goes to the IBC. I had a rule of thumb in the quarterly meeting of the bankers. I said this, you write off one rupee. If you recover one rupee from earlier written off NPAs. Right. So if you recover 5,000 crore, you can write off you can write off 5,000 crore in that year. So there was an incentive to uh, recover as well as accommodate. Common. Now there is no incentive, no discretion to the bank to accommodate a borrower, to distinguish between a business failure and fraud and to recover. So he simply goes by the rule book and goes to his lawyer and say, file an IBC, end of the matter. But sir, also, do you think this has in some way even led to restriction of uh, credit lending from the bank? Bankers are not even wanting Completely. to lend so much credit in the market now. Completely. You, you vilify, they have damaged, denigrated and vilified the banking system and the bankers so much in the last five to six years. Called bankers, thieves, fraudsters. I mean, respected bankers, I don't want to take the name known for their integrity, unimpeachable integrity, were arrested, put in jail until they got bail. Now, which banker would want to lend? In fact, bankers who have got less than a year to retire say, so why should I lend? I'd rather retire in 10 months, retire in nine months. Why should I lend now and have the CBI after me for the rest of my life? No banker is going to lend today. The whole atmosphere is so vitiated, so poisonous, so suspicious that no banker will be willing to lend unless it is backed by a foolproof security. And there again, the collateral will only be 60%. The right. lend, lending will be only 60% of the value. Sir, uh, do you also feel that this has led to the emergence of the NBFCs in a way that they were never there before? So now that the banks are hesitant, hesitant to lend, the NBFCs are not only lending, they are demanding a higher interest rate than what was off, what is offered by the bank. They are slightly less regulated in comparison to the banks. And in the end, the people are getting robbed of their profits. So all that hard work that an individual puts in his business to earn money, to earn something is being legally siphoned off, I would say. <laughs> there is no illegality to this. But he, right, sir. This is the structure of finance. Banks will give you the lowest interest rate. NBFCs will charge you more. The money lender will charge you even more. So when there is scarcity of credit, the guy who is willing to lend will bound to take advantage of that scarcity and charge you more. That's one reason. The second reason is the cost of money for NBFCs has also gone up. Right. NBFCs don't get the kind of refinance that they used to get. Right. Don't get the kind of uh, uh, infusion of funds that they used to get. Cost of money has gone up. So the cost of money has gone up and there are less, fewer lenders in the market. NBFC will try to make as much profit as he can from the limited lending that he can do. The whole thing is a chain. You have to understand how the chain works. Uh, right. Hello. The business. This is what is going to happen. Government must get out of all this, not get into every aspect of lending, every aspect of recovery. Government is this government is the most intrusive government uh, since uh, 1991 when we started withdrawing. Right, right. Sir, uh, yeah, as you're aware, sir, there is a reserve of around USD 500 million with the government of India. 
sir to what extent do you think this reserve will get eroded during this crisis the usd 500 billion reserves that the government holds which it has portrayed that will lead to development of india to a 500 trillion economy because looking at present scenario i think we we are already out of it i don't Sorry, sir. No, I don't expect a run on our. I don't expect a run on our reserves. Right. The rupee will depreciate a bit. And therefore, there will be some some running down, drawing down of reserves. But I think our reserves are uh, at a very comfortable level. I don't expect a run on our reserves. But we'll have to quickly uh, ramp up exports. If exports don't ramp up. Um, at the moment, you see it appears to have a current account surplus because imports are also down and exports are down. But that's not the way an economy works. Right. We have a current account deficit. There right. is a difference between the value of imports and the value of exports. We have to ramp up exports because remittances this year is going to be low. Right. Because our Dubai workers and our Middle East workers are not going to remit enough money. So right. we, we have to ramp up exports. If exports pick up, I do, I'm not uh, very worried about the running down of reserves but we can take corrective measures as we go along right sir also do you think that more than the covid 19 crisis and the impact that it has had what in turn during this time has come out is that the starvation factor in an in our economy is much much higher so do you think that will take a uh, proceeding and the government will eventually have to open uh, these restrictions and allow for business to flow for economy to take you know its grip back again because people are dying out of starvation sir migrant workers so many migrating to their native places even if you allow them to work in their native places as laborers which they were doing in other states even that can help but there has to be some relief now sir uh, i'm not wanting to make this political but in uh, you must have heard recently uh, unfortunately a very mass uh, religious leader Daddaji, in the state of madhya pradesh passed away and a lot of chief ministers and people had gone to offer their condolences in person it denied all laws of social distancing and everything that the government has been uh, you know proclaiming for so long so when the government wills it you know all rules and regulations they are they come off and when it is actually required for some restrictions to come down for things to start again for the system to get back in its uh, way of working there is uh, absolutely no decision in that context okay now i think the government was completely unprepared when it imposed a lockdown it should have thought through the consequences of a lockdown. It should have also prepared an exit strategy from a lockdown. In a country like India, social distancing will work for three weeks, four weeks, five weeks. It can't work forever, be that as it may. You're talking about starvation. You've touched a very important point. There are estimates of poverty are completely wrong. I plead guilty to that also. Why? Because a guy who's earning 400 rupees a day is not considered below the poverty line. But when he loses his job, overnight he goes below the poverty line. Yes, sir. What has happened to our migrant worker? As long as he was in Mumbai, Pune, Bengaluru, Chennai, earning 400 rupees, 450 rupees a day as a construction worker, as a delivery agent, he was uh, happy, he was uh, living um, uh, reasonably well, eating food and remitting some money to his family. The moment he loses that 450 rupees, he becomes absolutely poor. He's a destitute. Yes. And what you see, the lakhs of people, lakhs and lakhs of people who are working are destitutes. They are not beggars originally. They were workers. They are the ones who build our homes, our government offices, our private offices, our malls, our cinema theatres. But they become destitute overnight once they lose their jobs. So I think we need to have a better measure of poverty. 
how many people are on the edge of poverty entirely dependent upon that job that income they should be actually counted as very poor so they have no other income and they have no other assets they have no other wealth which is why it's an eye opener to see lakhs and lakhs of people trekking trudging along the highways uh, taking with their children some uh, so called belongings walking 400 500 kilometers it's a pathetic sight and this government i'm sorry to say has been completely hard uh, heartless careless and cruel in not going to their rescue they have transported they say 10 lakh people by train but something like 1 and 1/2 crore has walked back now why did you not provide buses and uh, trains for uh, just 1 and 1/2 crore and when they go home what do they get they get tested screened quarantine and sent home without a pie now why don't you give them cash when they go home i think various suggestions have been put forward i have myself put forward a number of suggestions but somehow this government is not persuaded to put cash in the hands of the poor and i'm afraid people may uh, people may forget uh, this uh, phase but they will never forgive the pain they were put through what 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 is the reason uh, you foresee that uh, the government is not uh, taking such kind of valuable suggestions and implementing them there are two reasons one is ignorance there is not enough talent in this government which understands macroeconomic management the prime minister is not supposed to be an expert on macroeconomic management Uh, he has been a chief minister for many years he is an administrative uh, uh, acumen for macroeconomic management you need people who understand how to manage a macro economy managing a macro economy is different say managing a newspaper business is different from managing a construction of a road or a bridge this is macro economy these are uh, invisible unknown factors you have to understand and manage this government is short of that number 2 this government is a prisoner of its own fears it somehow has got this irrational fear that the rating agencies will downgrade us and we will go bust why would rating agencies downgrade india alone every country is facing a recession germany france italy spain so they have to ground way ground downgrade 150 countries if they downgrade 150 let them downgrade india also relative grading will remain the same na if a class teacher marks all students down the relative grading will remain the same correct <laughs> then sir why why the every time you know uh, instead of uh, making a meeting with the finance people the prime minister comes and he declares then the details will follow why this pattern is adopted by This, this is this is a style of management. This is the style of the prime minister. He takes credit. He captures the headline by his grand announcement. When it comes to details, he walks away. Remember, he announced the first lockdown. He announced the second lockdown. But the third lockdown, he didn't announce. See, home ministry notification. The fourth lockdown, home ministry notification. So I think that is the style of this prime minister. I don't want to comment on personal styles. His style is to capture headlines and. leave everything else to everyone else which is why there is such a gap between intention and implementation also sir uh, as the prime minister in his last open interview to the country said that the country needs to move towards uh, being self dependent you know and self sufficient was the term used sir how is it possible that and on what measure a country which has so many of so much high population under living under below the poverty line sir atmanirbhar sir at below the poverty line you have so much of population living your businesses are unsuccessful because of the economical collapse that you are facing how can people turn to self self sufficiency at this point of time sir how can you even urge the people to go towards that the prime minister talked about self reliance there's nothing wrong with the word self reliance remember when we were importing wheat from the us indira ji said we must become self sufficient in food grain that's the same there's nothing new we became self sufficient thanks to the green revolution all right sir 
So we became self-sufficient in say many, many items of production, uh, rice, wheat, sugar, jute, uh, etc. But we can't be self-sufficient or self-reliant on every goods and every services. Uh, we don't have the raw material, we don't have the technology, we don't have the capital. Therefore, self-reliance cannot be at the cost of competitiveness, right. cannot be at the cost of efficiency cannot be at the cost of competing with the global production of goods and services. Our goods and services will become global brands only if they are competitive with what is manufactured in China, Japan, etc., etc. For example, our software today is competitive with the best software produced in Germany or France or Russia or China or US, which is why our companies can go abroad and sell their software. But we are not self-reliant on hardware. Our hardware is not as competitive as the hardware produced in other countries. So the difference between uh, becoming truly self-reliant and not being self-reliant is our ability to become efficient and competitive. I'm giving you a simple example. In software, we are competitive, therefore we are self-reliant. In hardware, we are not competitive, therefore we are not self-reliant. The same thing applies. In basic steel, we are self-reliant and competitive. In special steels, we are not self-reliant and competitive. In cement, we can be self-reliant. We can export cement because the technology is not uh, rocket science. We have absorbed the best technology of the world in cement. It all depends upon efficiency, technology, and competitiveness. In this uh, time of uh, this pandemic disease, we have come across that our complete uh, medical system is collapsed. We living in Bombay, living in Delhi, uh, in this crisis time, we face and we feel that the medical facilities in India are totally collapsed. Even in Bombay, you see, even in Delhi, even all metros, we are unable to serve the people. You see, we have good doctors, nurses, paramedics, and human resources. But all our governments, center state, have neglected basic health care for the masses. We have built fantastic tertiary and super speciality hospitals. We have neglected primary health care. We have neglected the secondary health care, which is the district and taluk and state hospitals you are talking about. Right. We have neglected them. We don't give them money. We don't give them enough money to buy equipment, which is why suddenly we find we don't have ventilators. Now, ventilator is again not rocket technology. Yeah. It is a basic requirement of every hospital that for so many beds you must have so many ventilators. We didn't give them money, they didn't buy ventilators. Therefore, I think our priorities must change. We must prioritize our expenditure in a manner that we spend enough on the secondary health care as well as on the primary health care. We must have some super speciality hospital. Who says no, no, otherwise our best doctors will go away. But we must spend enough money on secondary health care so that our district level hospitals are more or less able to meet the requirements of the average person. Our district hospitals are in terrible shape. And our primary health centers in many states are closed most of the time. They're not even open. There's no doctor, there's no nurse there. But you find a hospital like Ames, Jipmer, um, in uh, uh, Pondicherry, the uh, Jipmer in Pondicherry, all them buzzing with activity because they're super speciality. Yeah. But secondary health care, what about primary health care? That's where we need more beds, more equipment, more uh, technology, more money, eventually more money. And the way, the way, lockdown has been announced 
and the way state government chief ministers are coming on television and uh, you know uh, i can see that they are marketing of fear you see the central government is very cleverly after the third lockdown passed the buck to the states uh, they have <laughs> practically washed their hands remember the first lockdown and second yeah. lockdown when um, kerala wanted to go beyond the guidelines yeah. the home secretary put a stern letter saying you cannot go one inch beyond the guidelines today yesterday he writes a letter to the kerala government and other governments you can open um, uh mean uh, whatever you want to open uh, even barber shops can be open therefore they are passing the buck now look at the state government they are mortally scared scared state governments are worried about the number of infections and the number of deaths those two numbers are haunting them every day the yes. chief minister gets up in the morning and is haunted by these two numbers yeah. and remember uh, you have got Kerala, Tamil Nadu, Bengal, Bihar going to elections next year. This right. year and next year. Therefore, this fear of elections is also haunting them. Sir, even in Madhya Pradesh, we are we are having elections in I think two months. Yes, mini mini general election. Yeah, mini mini election. Mini election. Therefore, this is the fear. So the fear. But then there's no way out unless a vaccine is found. This virus is going to be with us. You and I have to protect oneself. by social distancing wearing a mask washing our hands and trying to avoid crowded places people have got that awareness they will protect themselves fortunately and god bless this country god has blessed this country the fatality rate is still very low it's only 3.2% so we have to live with this fact that some people will get infected and some of those will die but the bulk the overwhelming number something like 95% will recover and go home but that can't be helped but we can't uh, uh, allow this fear to haunt us and uh, completely devastate our economy <laughs> chief minister punjab told me uh, all my rural india is rural countryside is open but jalandhar and ludhiana are red zones now what if jalandhar and ludhiana are red zones what is industrial activity in yeah. punjab nothing will work nothing bombay chennai coimbatore are all closed therefore i think we have to get out of this fear psychosis and face the world boldly while at the same time public spaces can be controlled parks cinemas malls they can be controlled but otherwise people must be allowed to do their work and tell them listen you protect yourself please protect yourself it's very simple protection it doesn't cost money you have to wear a mask you have to maintain a social distance avoid crowded places and wash your hands as often as possible so uh, what i personally feel because uh, i am into media and uh, since last uh, 30 years i am writing and i have seen that the government you know the one they announce everything free then they literally charge the people it's that why why is that well these are uh, bureaucratic uh, clawbacks and then the government and minister will announce a policy and then the bureaucrat will start writing the rules and the details and half the policy will be eaten up in the details and in the rules but that is the way a bureaucracy functions uh, we need to be able to command and control the bureaucracy uh, the minister is weak the bureaucracy will control and command the minister oh yeah correct so this uh, so the wind up now please uh, the yeah. last question sir the second highest uh, yeah. revenue for the state is liquor and on liquor Correct. every government has a different view and they want to open it but they are delaying it and when these liquor uh, people wanted that some discount to be offered to them because they have not the shops are not uh, opening uh, for those hours and uh, uh the uh, uh, security margins are high and uh, they are under red zone also some of the majority of the shops so why the government doesn't accept this some i take the mean. example of madhya pradesh government they are expecting 10000 crore rupees revenue 
here the liquor association says ki you whatever we sell you take the duty but don't compel us to take a stock we don't know what the sale would be see i have no sympathy for anyone in the liquor business uh, maybe because i'm a teetotaler teetotaler the point is the prohibition has failed prohibition won't succeed anywhere in the world gujarat is supposed to be a prohibition state but yeah. liquor flows freely in gujarat yes and anybody can get any amount of liquor in gujarat so i think uh, governments are caught between the devil and the deep sea they want to pretend that they are votaries of moderation and prohibition but they also are very tempted by the revenue from liquor um some states are entirely dependent upon liquor revenue pondicherry for example the only source of revenue is liquor yeah i think we simply have to accept the norm that liquor will be sold and if you ban liquor for a day two a week you can ban but people who are used to liquor will find another way to get the liquor otherwise it will be illicit liquor and that is worse than illicit liquor i think we have to come to terms with the reality and not cling to our fetishes and our fashions simply accept the reality that liquor has come to stay and liquor is a business it has to be done like any other business and it has to be taxed in proportion to what that business can bear if you tax it more than the capacity to bear they will sell it under the table right right this curious liquor will be sold i think governments have to come to terms with this reality rather than stick to the fads do you see more lockdown sir in future <laughs> one more you see lockdown now yielding diminishing returns there is no returns in lockdown anymore there will be a lockdown 5 after june 1 somebody like punjab or telangana may announce a lockdown 5 but it will be a it will be a simple mockery yeah. uh, for example i'm told in haryana there is effectively no lockdown yeah in tamil rural tamil nadu except the cities the four or five major cities there is virtually uh, no restriction at all so i think the best thing to do is to generally gradually even during lockdown 4 relax the lockdown look at this stupid rule they resume the passenger trains on a tuesday at 4 o'clock they stop the train on a thursday and today there is an announcement we will start the run trains again right this is flip flop without interstate bus transport train transport and air transport how can business and commerce function how can business and commerce function without interstate movement of people goods and services but i think all this must be removed even before 31st may 1st of june onwards yes public spaces must be controlled severely amounting to a lockdown malls cinemas parks crowded places places of worship where huge gatherings come all that has to be controlled for some more time in order to prevent a rapid spread of the virus all other spaces must be opened up for the voting sir we can uh, maintain the distance of course we had the uh, uh, south korea hold elections with social distancing they were quite successful the south korea is very small in front of india and in front of madhya pradesh also you don't look at the size you look at the density of population if you look at the density of population japan is denser than india yeah south korea as dense as india therefore given the lands and the people it's about the same to manage an election in south korea or to manage an election in madhya pradesh correct sir sir is india entering uh, recession Yes. If yes, how long yes. do you suspect? We will have negative growth this year, 2020, 2021. We will be lucky if we get away with zero growth. But most analysts say we will have negative growth up to minus five percent. So that's inevitable. This government has not come up with a stimulus package. Therefore, the chance that I gave this government of stimulating growth vanished uh, day before yesterday. I'm afraid that we have to settle for zero growth. if not negative growth i think we conclude on that note thank, thank you thank you sir thank you sir. thank you thank you very much please maintain social distancing 
and also take care of yourself and your family. Thanks for watching News Network today.